get this thing started. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We are going uh, to uh, have a wonderful webinar. I am Chris Short, Principal Technical Marketing Manager at Red Hat. I am also a Cloud Native Ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to talk as an attendee. Sorry. But there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, feel free to drop your questions in there. And either myself or I will ask Tim, we'll get those answered. And um, <clears throat> let's, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Tim Atnell, a uh, coworker and senior product manager at Red Hat. And he'll be talking about uh, building Kubernetes operators in an Ansible native way. Take it away, Tim, thanks. Great, thanks, Chris, and thanks everyone for uh, tuning in. Uh, like Chris said, my name is Tim Atmel. I'm a, a senior product manager with the Ansible team, and I'm a longtime Ansible guy. Uh, really know my way around Ansible, having been a, a contributor, and then later was a um, user customer and joined Ansible and came along for the ride when we were acquired by Red Hat. So I'm actually not a Kubernetes guy. I mean, I've been learning it. I really love it. Uh, but I, I come from this Ansible background. What I wanted to share is, is a way that you can use Ansible and uh, Kubernetes together. So uh, let's see, am I sharing my slides, Chris? Can everyone see? Yes, you are good to go. Okay, great, excellent. Uh, so what we're going to be covering today is uh, uh, you know, just a little bit of background about what are operators for those who may not be as familiar and why you'd want to use them. And then why would you want to use Ansible uh, to, to build them? And how do you even do them? You know, why would you want to build them uh, using Ansible? Because you know, isn't, isn't Ansible one of those traditional IT tools? What does that have to do with cloud native uh, applications and architectures? Uh, and then I'm going to, um, you know, like I said, show, do some demos of how you would develop your first operator with Ansible and actually show uh, a, a basic one that, that we've developed and, and then give you some um, information on how uh, you could learn more about this. So with that, uh, I'm gonna start off, this is clearly a CNCF webinar and we all know and love Kubernetes and, and what it can do and all the, the, the functionality and how it's bringing web scale architectures uh, uh, to our industry and how you can utilize it and all the great things that it that it can do. So it's just worth pointing that out because what operators can do is is build on all of that great functionality and all that power of Kubernetes here. Uh, and then what Ansible can do is is make that more accessible to more people to be able to use and 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 um, automate what happens on their Kubernetes clusters and, and with their cloud native, you know, complex applications. So what it, most, a lot of people don't realize is that really Ansible and Kubernetes are uh, quite a natural fit and have a lot of similarities in, in a number of ways. Uh, you know, both of them help make hard things easier through uh, automation and orchestration. Uh, and they're both very active, widely used open source projects. And last year we were, um, I think we were six and seven on the GitHub Octoverse uh, um, um, report when it came out for activity. So we were, you know, the Kubernetes and, and Ansible projects were right there neck and neck in the, you know, in the top 10. So we both have very vibrant communities working together to solve common problems. Uh, you know, we have KubeCon coming up and, you know, it's going to be, you know, from what I'm hearing, you know, 12,000 people gathering there. I'll be there in the Red Hat booth for any of you who want to stop by and say hi. I'll be talking about uh, this there. Uh, and the other thing is that they both use YAML to describe this desired state of the world. They're both desired state engines. They both use YAML. And here's an example of what I mean. On the left here, we have a definition file that you could use with Cube Control, for example, uh, setting up a config map. Uh, and you could feed that in and great, you have a config map now in your uh, Kubernetes cluster. On the right side is a single task from an Ansible playbook using our Kates module that defines the exact same config map. And you can see by the, the parts that are in red are almost identical to the, uh, the definition file you would use with kube control. 
Now, the one thing I always like to point out, and one of the um, uh, you know, first advantages of using Ansible for this is if you look down there at the color, there's a, uh, a Jinja2 uh, variable there for templatizing what you do. And this is something that hopefully I'll be able to show you in the demos that you could templatize this, the, your definition files and how you, how you deploy and manage things in Kubernetes. If uh, inlining the definition file, like I showed in the last slide, isn't your thing, you can also do something like this. In fact, a lot of people do this and, and we actually have it set up this way in our uh, uh, demo operator that I'll, I'll show later. Uh, you can keep the definition file separately as a template or as a YAML file and read them right into your, your playbook and feed them into um, the Kates module to get passed on to the uh, Kates API. So it's a nice little piece of syntactic sugar you can use to uh, manage your files differently if you don't want to keep a, uh, a playbook, uh, keep all this in a playbook. You can you know, keep it separately uh, as files and manage them accordingly. All right, so that was a little bit of the similarities that there are between Kubernetes and Ansible and how they can work together. You know, let's do a quick review of what are operators, what are Kubernetes operators, uh, for those of you who may not be as familiar with it, or just to set some context here, what we're talking about. So as I was saying, we all know Kubernetes, love Kubernetes, um, and, it, and it's incredibly powerful and brings a lot of functionality to uh, doing things in highly available, scalable uh, manner in a consistent way, uh, bringing a lot of, of best practices and functionality there. Uh, the, and that's great and gets us so far, especially when our, we can make our applications or our services stateless, because that's easy. It can be that very um, genericized and it can be handled in such a way that uh, you know, if, if a pod dies, that Kubernetes can just replace it and things continue on and they work great. But what do you do when you have to use state, when your application needs this special handling uh, in, in how you uh, manage upgrades, how you manage uh, scaling events, how you manage failures, things of that nature. Kubernetes cannot uh, in and of itself capture all of that operational knowledge in order to manage that application. And that's where operators come in because stateful, you know, that, that statefulness is hard um, and, and is unknown to Kubernetes and operators let you bring that extra smarts to uh, what uh, uh, Kubernetes can do. So, uh, like I said, operators are there to manage complex Kubernetes applications. They can encode this human operational knowledge. They can, uh, you know, handle things such as uh, patches, upgrades, uh, you know, scaling events, things of that nature, and to do it in a Kubernetes native way that we can um, um, just, uh, you know, do it right on the cluster itself. So these operators are, are purpose built for your specific applications and services to give Kubernetes that extra smart and to not just handle in installing and setting up your application, but do all the day to management of what happens, you know, managing the entire life cycle and what happens after the install and the, and, and, and the setup, uh, uh, you know, initially happens. Um, sorry. So without, without operators, what happens is, is we get, uh, and, and when we have these special, you know, these stateful applications that require this extra, um, extra knowledge, special handling, uh, you, you end up in a reactive mode without operators that you have to continually check for anomalies or for events happening in your, your cluster and alert a human if something happens so that they can respond. So one of your operators has to deal with you know, possibly um, um, intervening and it could be, it could take them minutes, could take them hours. It may require them getting up in the middle of the night to, to, to deal with this stuff. So that's less than ideal. With an operator, you get to be more proactive. You can, uh, you know, because it's running on the cluster and it is continuously adjusting for that optimal state and monitoring what is the, the current state of what's happening on the cluster, it's able to react within seconds 
and make the adjustments and, and perform the operations needed to keep the application healthy and running um, as expected. So when we look at what an operator is, it really is a, a controller with a very uh, specific pattern. Uh, so we, we have the Cades API and, and what makes operators go are custom resources and you create a custom resource around uh, your particular application. Then the operator itself is just a controller and that has two uh, special parts to it or, or, or two functions going on. One is for the controller to watch events happening on the Kubernetes cluster uh, uh, for the resources that your application is using. And then when something does occur to do something called a reconcile loop. And what a reconcile does is, is take the actions necessary to get the application in the desired state it should be in when the state changes. And so, it, so what's happening then is this controller, this, this operator um, is managing your uh, Kubernetes application on the other, um, uh, 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 according to the operational knowledge that you fed into it. So the operator, uh, just to take a, a step back for a second here, operators are uh, uh, part of, uh, come from the operator framework. This is something that uh, CoreOS began and then when they joined the Red Hat family, uh, we've, we've continued to invest in and, and, and advance further. There are three parts to this operator framework, this, this toolkit to um, uh, build and manage uh, operators on any Kubernetes cluster. This is all, uh, I should have mentioned this earlier on, this is not specific to Red Hat or OpenShift, which is um, our, our cloud native platform, which Kubernetes is very much at the center of. This can be used with any, any uh, Kubernetes. In fact, I'll show this a little bit later. When I do my demo, I'm using Minikube. Um, so there are three parts to it. I'm gonna be talking mostly from here on out about the operator SDK, which is what you would use to uh, build your operators and, uh, and specifically the part of the operator SDK I'm going to be talking about is the Ansible part that's built, built into that. There's also uh, implementations for doing it in Golang, of course, and then also uh, some limited stuff you can do with Helm. Uh, also part of the operator framework is the lifecycle manager for doing install updates and manage of operators and their dependencies. So it's a nice kind of package manager like tool. Um, and then they're also for doing operator uh, metering so that you can um, get metrics out of that and, and for, for customers that need to do things like chargebacks and things of that nature, that's what they're, that's there for. But we're gonna be focusing on the operator SDK part from here out, but that's what makes up the operator framework that's out there. And uh, all that is, of course, we're Red Hat, it is uh, open source and can be found at this uh, GitHub repo you see at the bottom of my slide. Okay, so that was enough about operators and, and some background uh, on that there. Uh, why would you wanna build an operator uh, with Ansible? Well, okay, so the idea is we're taking a lot of the same principles that uh, have gone into Ansible in general in traditional IT space, whether it's, it's, it's cloud or, or networking or, or bare metal or Windows machines, you know, the idea of making things easier uh, to do. So taking this, the, um, you know, doing powerful things in a very simple way. Uh, and so in this case here, we're trying to make it easier to deploy and manage these Kubernetes applications, but do it in that Nans uh, Ansible native way. Um, so what we're trying to bring to that is, is taking, you know, we have this traditional IT, uh, a lot of people have invested in, in automating with Ansible. Uh, and to really reuse a lot of those skills in this um, existing ecosystem and this thriving community that's out there. So using all those uh, tried and trusted uh, Ansible tools and, and to reuse that knowledge that, that a lot of organizations are already have and are using for managing things that aren't cloud native. Because I mean, as, as much as we all love cloud native, there's still going to be traditional IT around for the foreseeable future. Um, so this gives you a chance to use that same, uh, the community and to also be able to automate uh, the uh, entire 
stack, whether it's cloud native or traditional IT, uh, with one simple language uh, uh, and one, one uh, automation engine. It also uh, allows, it, it lowers the barrier of entry to what type of skills and knowledge a person needs in order to automate these applications and to manage these applications. Um, because it's Ansible, you don't need uh, programming skills in order to, to uh, automate what is happening on your cluster with these operators uh, that are written in Ansible. Um, and e even if you do have the programming skills uh, to do this type of thing, this will let you iterate faster and it'll make maintenance easier so you can focus your time on other things that, that require your attention that cannot be as, as easily handled as what we can do here. Uh, as I already showed, is, uh, uh, it, it uses declarative state definitions just like Kate's itself and you can template all that which can make things uh, much more repeatable and reusable than the standard tooling that's out there. So it, it can really, you know, help you do uh, get more out of all the, the great things that Kubernetes um, and, and, and cloud native systems can do. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's uh, three uh, ways that the operator framework lets you develop uh, um, operators. Uh, there's Helm, but Helm's limited to only doing the, the, what you see there as phase one, the basic installation. Uh, Ansible and Golang, those, those two types, uh, you can do the entire uh, life cycle of, of operators. It's one of the things that I get a lot as I talk to um, customers and, and, and at events and conferences, a lot of people think that, well, I'm somehow gonna be limited if I use Ansible and I really need to use Golang. And, and what we've found is in the people that are writing uh, operators with Ansible is that, that, that it can do pretty much everything. There is going to be that very, very, uh, what we believe small edge cases where you really need to get into uh, the and and very closely control what's happening on the cluster in the Kate's API, uh, where you then may need to move to uh, using GoLang itself. But for the vast majority of use cases that we've seen out there, Ansible's been able to handle them all and go across and do um, the entire lifecycle uh, of uh, that a, an operator needs to manage. All right, so let's uh, take a little bit of a closer look at how a, a, an operator uh, written in Ansible looks. So this is a, a, another version of the, of the uh, diagram I showed a little bit earlier. And what's different is that we'll, you see that we have a few extra things going on inside of, of this operator. So what, what, when, you, when you build an operator using Ansible, you get this uh, a binary, this generic operator that's been written that gets packaged in and bundled for you. This comes for free. You don't have to touch it. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, the things that you as, a, as a, someone developing an operator with Ansible have, are responsible for is the watch file. And what the watch file does is define the uh, uh, group version kind that you, the resource that you want to watch. And then you define what playbook or role should be run when something changes in the state of that resource. So this is how we map events happening in the Kubernetes cluster to uh, an Ansible playbook or role that is inside of the operator itself. So taking a deeper dive into that and, and going through the, the workflow, uh, so you have this operator SDK binary that's part of the, uh, uh, the, the, the operator that gets built. And that has a number of functions in there for you. Generic, uh, well, I don't know if generic is the right word, but all the common plumbing that you really have to take care of and be mindful of when you are writing an operator that you don't, uh, that you really need to take care of. So for example, uh, it, it provides a reverse proxy and that proxy uh, takes the calls coming from your Ansible automation and adds owner references to it. And that's to make sure that garbage collection works correctly. It does a fair bit of aggressive uh, caching so that you don't uh, you know, pound your uh, Kate's API proxy too hard uh, and, and you know, essentially create a denial of service attack on your own Kubernetes cluster. 
Um, so it, it's doing a lot of things like that. And that's actually written in Go. So it's a very, very efficient uh, operator going. The other thing that this is doing is that when the uh, container initializes, it is reading in that watches file so it knows what it is looking for. So at that point, that uh, binary, when it sees that an event happens, it will then um, um, look at what was defined in the watches file and then run the Ansible playbook or role that's been defined for it, take the response coming back from Ansible itself and then pass that along uh, to the custom resource to update the, the status uh, of, your, um, of, of your operator. So events are happening, it's going into the operator itself. The uh, Ansible automation runs there, it goes, updates the status and manages your Kubernetes application, does its reconciliation on the cluster itself. All right. So that's, that's how uh, Ansible operators work. Uh, developing them can be uh, you know, quite easy and we've tried to make this as frictionless as possible. So there's a few steps that you have to take here. You can get the operator SDK, like I said completely open source tool. It's available through a, a number of different ways. Uh, I'm using a MacBook here. I used Homebrew to install uh, my copy here. So what you do to get started is use the uh, operator SDK to do a new and hand it a few pieces of metadata. What is the operator itself? What's the API? Um, what's the kind? And then the, the, the most important part, if you're going to be using Ansible here, is to use that type equals Ansible that you see there at, in red at the end of the command. One thing I wanna stress, I've said this once, but I, 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 wanna, I think it's worth repeating again here is this is a native part of the operator SDK. This is not a plugin or some extra thing that you need to add. When you install the operator SDK, you get this right, right out of the box. So at this point, what will happen, and I'm going to show this to you in a moment in the, in the demo, is this will build out an entire uh, project for you. Uh, not only will it create the uh, skeleton of a, uh, of a role, to write your uh, Ansible uh, automation, but it will also create deploy files for you. It will create a build file for you. It creates basic tests in Molecule, which is a uh, testing framework for Ansible content. Uh, it creates a whole bunch of really nice things that really get you up and running quickly to developing the operator. So at that point now you have a, a project ready to go. Uh, you just need to write your automation uh, with Ansible, uh, whatever those steps are. Often it's going to be using the Kates module, which is pretty a now, uh, 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 pretty much a, like cube control, but with some extra Ansible things to it. So anything you can do with a cube control or even the OC command, if you're an OpenShift user, uh, you can use that module for to get things done. Uh, so you write your automation, you then have to define your watch file. The act in all actuality, that new command creates a watches file for you based on the inputs you've given it. Sometimes you don't even have to touch the watches file, but if you do, there's already one started. Um, it's a pretty straightforward, small little YAML file that you have to edit. Very straightforward uh, thing to, 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 to use and, and, and manage. At that point, you have your automation ready to go. You've run your tests. You feel good about what you want to do. You run, run this build command. Uh, it's a very, it's actually a very shallow thing that's been added for convenience. But at this point, it, everything gets assembled. It takes your Ansible automation, it takes a lot of different, uh, a, a base image that has all the necessary dependencies of Python and um, Ansible, Ansible runner, some things like that, bundles it all up into a container that now you can deploy to your Kubernetes cluster through any means. It's just, it's at that point a self, it's a container ready to go. Uh, you do not need to install anything special on your cluster. Uh, you do not have to use OpenShift. It should work on any uh, Kubernetes system at this point. It's just another controller uh, container. So to, uh, taking a step back and I've, I've been talking about this, but it, again, it, this uh, is worth repeating. Uh, this is the anatomy of an Ansible uh, enabled operator. What you see in the white 
as for, for all of you that would, are developing an operator with Ansible, that's the part that you are responsible for. Creating the roles or the playbooks and the watches file and managing that. Everything you see in that gray box, you get for free using the uh, Ansible operator SDK when you do the build command. So those are all the things I talked to you about um, so far, that, that, uh, that binary, that generic um, Go operator, uh, the Ansible, Ansible runner, all the Python libraries, all the things that you need, you just get. And so that you can focus on just what is it I need to automate about my Kubernetes application in order to keep it healthy and running smoothly uh, and, and you know, kind of creating that uh, public cloud native experience of, of managing services through a UI or, or whatever you're using to manage um, your, your Kubernetes services. So that's, I think, a really, really nice thing and, and really uh, speaks to how uh, using Ansible can make things uh, easier and more accessible to more people in your IT organization to uh, uh, participate and contribute in your cloud native systems. Okay, so uh, drum roll here. Uh, I'm going to do, uh, um, try and do some, show some examples and, and do some live demos of what I've been talking about to give you a sense of uh, what's, uh, how this stuff works. So you're that's, right on schedule. Oh, excellent. And I've been ignoring my clock. So that's, that's, uh, wow, I'm even <laughs> impressed with myself right now. Yes, I'm okay. quite impressed as well. Yeah. So, uh, so there's one question in the chat that I'm going to try and answer live while you're getting set up here. Um, okay. uh, Attend Sood said, is one new controller created for each entry in a watch file with Ansible operator or just one controller for the entire watch file? My it understanding one, yeah. yeah, my understanding is it's one controller to the like entire watch file, AKA the entire operator equals one controller. Yes. The one operator can be watching multiple things. Correct. Right. Um, attend if that does not answer your question, let me know. Um, do Ansible based operators handle concurrency? Uh, in the sense of what? <laughs> yeah. I'm Concurrency not. like Go in the sense of like a programming language? Obviously not, because Ansible is not a programming language like Go. But uh, if you mean like executing multiple tasks at once, it is achievable. Um, and then there's one question here I got to reread while you're still getting set up. Okay. It's uh, a follow up. Both Go and Ansible. Chris, is my terminal window displaying? Oh. Yes, it is. It is. Okay, great. You could increase the font like a little bit. That'd be great. Let me do that. Okay, hopefully that um, looks good. Okay, if anybody great. can't see you, let me know. Um, handle multiple events to reconcile. Yes. Uh, Carlton, it can handle multiple events. It can watch for multiple events to reconcile. Uh, it creates a CRD. So you can have it essentially watch for, it watches for any event to happen on um, the group version or the kind uh, for the CRD and then triggers as a result. So uh, it does handle you know, multiple events and reconciliation loops. Okay. So uh, I'm going to keep moving on here uh, since I hate typing live. I, I've been um, running this through. So the first thing I'm going to do here in the in, uh, is show you how easy it is and what's in a project uh, when you use the operator SDK to do a new. So this is the line that you saw in my um, slides just a couple minutes ago where we're doing the new. I'm creating some called the null operator because it's not going to have anything in it. But the point here is to show you what you get when you initialize a project. Um, and so it's of kind null, and there's that type equals Ansible at that point. So um, if I run that, I get this uh, input that comes out of all the things it created. We're gonna take a look at that. Um, so I now have this directory whoop, here where we have a build, a deploy, a molecule. That's the testing uh, um, uh, the framework that I talked about. We have a roles directory in the watches file. So uh, let's take a quick tour here. What's in there in the build. 
we get a Docker file and we also get a Docker file and a, and a shell script that helps you run your tests. Uh, so when you're, you're working locally and trying to work this stuff out, you have something there to, uh, you know, to, to, to speed things up. Uh, under deploy, we have a, a number of uh, manifests uh, that can be used with Kubernetes that gets built out for doing things like, uh, you know, setting up your role, role binding service account and also the, uh, the CRD and the custom resource itself. So you could just feed them right into uh, cube control and get something up and running very quickly. Uh, let's see here. Um, and then I'll show you what's under the role. So any of you that are familiar with Ansible, you see you have what looks like a, a starter role here uh, of, of uh, something that you can write your tasks in, you can add your default variables or any internal variables or templates or whatever it is that you're doing. It's already created out uh, a skeleton of a role uh, for you to do your automation and so you don't have to create that yourself. So again, it's trying to make it really easy for you. And then um, we have the watches file here that it generated for us. So we see the group, uh, um, group version kind uh, based on the, the input that we gave it. And then we see that it is calling the role uh, null that uh, it created for us. Again, you could, this is just a starter. So you can add more entries to the questions that were being asked to ha have it watching uh, multiple resources and calling, uh, you could have multiple role, you could add multiple roles to your operators or, or different playbooks. Uh, you have a lot of flexibility at that point, a lot of power of Ansible in that. And some, some of the things that we've started uh, internally working with is you have the entire power uh, 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 functionality of Ansible here that you can use. Uh, one one uh, prototype that was done internally was for etcd and that can do a backup and restore to S3 because it's using the S3 module that's built into Ansible to send it off the cluster and, and you know, store a backup in uh, an S3 bucket. So something to consider. This is a, a, definitely a, a, a bonus of using Ansible and you, know, you had the templating, but then you have all those modules and all that functionality that uh, Ansible has for uses outside of uh, cloud native there. All right. So let me see here. Let's move on to the next thing. I'm not gonna do a build here because I think moving on to, to some of the other um, uh, material that I have here will be more interesting. So let's see, I should be back to my slides now, at least I hope. So the next thing I'm gonna show here is deploy uh, a, a Kubernetes application that has to be uh, orchestrated and managing multiple pods. We've tried to keep it as simple as possible just to, so you can follow along and uh, get an idea of what's happening, but also get a sense of the power of operators and how Ansible can help uh, manage these type of things when you need to coordinate multiple uh, pods and services and things. And what we've come up here with is a uh, scalable caching service and there are two components to it. We're using memcache, which has been around a really long time. Um, it's, you know, it's general purpose distributed memory caching system for database calls, APIs. Like I said, it, it's been around a while. It's very generic in nature. It doesn't have a lot of fancy features like replication and fallover and things like that. It just so happens, and I, I know this from experience because I was actually somewhat involved in memcache community almost 20 years ago. Uh, it, um, Facebook makes extensive use of memcache to this day. So they, they created a project called McRouter and McRouter sits in the front and it's a memcache protocol router and it uh, can help scale memcache deployments and add all type of extra uh, distributed functionality like connection pooling, flexible routing. There's a whole lot of things you can do with it. So what we're doing here is we're, we've created uh, this caching service around these two components where we're going to have a McRouter operator that we're going to deploy. And that is going to manage a single pod running McRouter. And McRouter needs to know how many memcache nodes does it have in its pool and be configured to know that. So as things happen like scaling events or, or, or errors happen and a um, uh, you know, memcache pod goes away or 
we scale back up because we're, you know, we're, we're, we're thriving as a business and, you know, we have more data and we, we need more caching uh, capabilities and we add more, that, um, that service, McRouter, knows about what is in its pool and, and is being adjusted for uh, dynamically on the cluster as these events are happening. There's no need to go in and manually reconfigure McRouter for what it has to work with. And this will happen within seconds of each other. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna move back to, um, I'm going to move back to my, my um, terminal, sorry. Struggling with my multitasking right now. Okay. Sorry, that's why I'm trying to be here and filling in that air. Um, so I think I've got all the questions answered. Uh, if you okay. feel like your question is not answered, um, please re-ask or rephrase. If you feel like uh, I've dismissed your question unnecessarily, uh, I'm sorry, this isn't a place to talk about GitHub issues. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, the uh, I think one of the questions that might be remaining, um, I understand that you can use Ansible to manage Kate's clusters like QCuddle. Yes, you can. Yes. Um, the Kate's module sure. can allow you to do that. Uh, you can, you know, uh, and, Tim showed earlier in the presentation using the Ansible lookup plugin to deploy, uh, you know, any kind of Kubernetes resource via, you know, YAML lookups. Um, but, you know, there's probably some edge cases where the, uh, you know, module and um, kubectl might be out of sync, right, version-wise. So that's always possible, but edge case again. Uh, we're not saying Ansible can replace or Ansible should replace. It's just, yes, it's there, you know, <laughs> but the case module exists to make things like the Ansible operator possible. Right. But it is, um, I, and this is something I was just working on. This is uh, still something that, that we're, we're building up. I do have some of that um, sort of cube cuddle replacement to, to show mm -hmm. the use of templating here uh, and reusability. Yeah, absolutely. Like I love to use Ansible for templating like a lot of KTML, right? Like if I need to change, uh, like I use uh, Ansible variables to manage resource limits like a lot um, just because I'm always tweaking those. So like each application will have one big group bar and I'll manage it like that. All right. Okay. Cool. Well, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, uh, move ahead and, and we can come back to, uh, more questions. Uh, hopefully I get, I get through this without incident. Uh, so what I have running here on my MacBook is a uh, mini cube and that's all up and running and looking great. And, uh, actually what I, I should have done is show you that I have nothing, um, nothing up my sleeve, so to speak here. And nothing's there right now. So great. Let's give it something to do. Um, so what I did here is just to speed up the time is uh, I've taken a lot of the, the, the role, role binding service account deployment uh, files that were um, generated. And I put them into one file here, McRouter operator. Uh, I'm going to run that here and now. Uh, we've created the custom resource definition, uh, the role, the role bonding, all that stuff I just said here. So uh, if I go back, um, actually what I should have done is this. All right, that's a little more readable. There you go. Uh, we now see that uh, just by running that, it's deployed the operator. So now our operator's out there, it's waiting for something to do. So uh, at this point, um, what I can do is, let me see here, I'm trying to remember where I put things on my machine. Okay, yes. So, um, uh, actually I should have shown you what's in this here. So what I do is I created a uh, file ahead of time. Uh, and all I did here was I, I added the, uh, 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 a custom resource called McRouter. I've uh, given it the name MyCache uh, service uh, default. 
namespace uh, is going to have a memcache pool size of two. Pool size is replicated instead of sharded. Uh, that was something I, I, I built in so that I can uh, control uh, what, what type of pool setup I'm using. So what I'm going to do now is uh, use that file to um, deploy things. And what I get when I do that is, oh, what did I just do? Where'd it go? All right, there it goes. It needed a second. All right, so uh, just by creating that custom resource, that one API call, we now see that we have a, uh, uh, a, a Mic router instance up there, which is, which is that uh, first my uh, cache service there, the second line, uh, the second pod that's listed there. And I got two memcache nodes that came up right away. Um, and they created all the necessary services and deployment and replica sets out there to make this stuff work and run. Um, so now we have an entire caching service ready to go. Now let's see here if I can uh, get a little fancy and to, to some of the uh, uh, questions that were put out there. What I tr was trying to do earlier today um, is I started creating a playbook to templatize that last step that you saw here. So uh, what, what I did was I created a, I took that file and I put in Jinja2 uh, templates uh, of variables in there so I can control things and I could roll out multiple of these cache servers, uh, services uh, under different names or namespaces or give it different pool sizes. So let's, uh, in this case, try and do uh, uh, increase the size of the pool um, so I'm just going to do this in the command line. You could have done this using um, uh, something like Ansible Tower. Or there's a whole bunch of other ways I could have been feeding this in. But for simplicity, I'm, I'm using um, the command line. So I have Ansible running on my machine. I'm going to call the playbook uh, that I wrote. And I'm going to tell it to give me a uh, pool size of Pool size of three will do. Let's see here if I get this right. So our playbook just ran. Um, and now we see, uh, oh, I probably got the, uh, the variable wrong back here. Oh, right. I know what I did. Forgot that. That's more like it. All right. There's the feedback that I, um, something changed when I ran that command. So if I do that, now we see I have a third uh, memcache node came up and the um, uh, McRouter has been informed that it now has a third memcache node to work with in its pool. Uh, one of the, and this is a this is a generic thing about um, I should have mentioned about operators in general, not just with Ansible here, but it can really help you uh, enforce policy. So if you are like, we need three nodes in memcache, and someone comes along and is doing things manually and doing things that they probably shouldn't be doing, what happens is that uh, this can help enforce that. So let's say I kill someone. Uh, I'm I'm you know, not following policy, I'm an operator and I go in there and I decide I want to take down a pod at this point. Uh, what happens is the operator is monitoring and says, hey, I'm supposed to have three uh, memcache nodes in my pool. That's the policy here. What happens is, is that we see that uh, the, the pod, the, the one that was in that I deleted was brought right back up by the, um, by the operator that's out there. So if we, so that's, that's an operator in action. Let me, let's see if I can take it a little bit further. I guess we have some time for this, right, Chris, or? Yeah, it's a uh, 48. Uh, so you got about 12 minutes left. Okay. So uh, let's say I need to deploy another one here. 
So I'm going to do one called CNCF cache and I need to quickly roll out a separate caching server for whatever reasons we decided we want to segment this and have, you know, the one that we already put up, but we need another one. So I'm going to create one CNCF cache um, at this point. And this is going to run and um, give it a second. Did I? There we go we now see that we are getting these CNCF um, services coming up. And now we've been able to repeatedly, very quickly rolled out a new um, uh, instance of our service. So we're seeing all of the, uh, in this case, I didn't change the pool size. So we got the default of two memcache nodes coming right up. And um, you know, it, it's created the deployment and the service for that, that memcache. And again, this is all, just using the basic templating that Ansible allows for in order to um, uh, very quickly adjust and, and redeploy in a repeatable way what we're doing on our um, what we're, we're doing on our cluster. Um, and then let's see the last thing I will show is let's say okay we use that we want to get rid of it I created a, um, a variable called state and if I change that to absent, that should then bring down uh, the stack. So we see now it's, you see things have already disappeared and it's terminating um, all, all the parts of that application service that we had out there. Okay. Um, so with that, I'm going to pause and see if, uh, there are any questions out there, Chris. So I fired off a bunch of answers. I'm not sure if they're fully qualified answers at this point. So let's okay. just run back through them real quick. Okay. Um, so the contents of the playbook that you just ran. Yes. So think, uh, can you show the playbook? Oh yes. Like Sorry. I, I Sorry. skipped that. I didn't mean to. No, that's fine. Uh, someone, someone, uh, just asked. That's it there. So um, I, I could have wrote this a little more elegantly. I'm just running it on my local host and I'm calling, I only have one task in this case. It could have been a lot more and there are examples of it having more. Um, um, I'm calling the Kate's module. There I have the state where I'm, uh, that variable that I used in the, the, the last step. Uh, and then I'm, I'm calling the uh, template file that I had and feeding that in as the definition that goes off to the, the, the Kate's API. So it was a pretty, pretty small, basic playbook. Um, I could have done more for if, if it necessitated it, but in this case, one task was enough. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I think I said this every time you and I have been in the same room together talking about this. Uh, the, one of the hardest problems we have in demonstrating just operators in general is that like we're trying to do, something that manages state and potentially like status and all these other different things, but package it up into this tiny little demo. And that's yeah. oftentimes very hard to do. Even when yes. we did a workshop at Ansible Fest a couple of weeks ago, it was you know a full day workshop and we still used the same McRouter example because explaining the entire concept and then demoing it is cumbersome uh, to package in such a way that is yeah. demonstrable. So uh, one more follow-up question here or a couple more. So how does the operator come into play in the delete pod example? The stateful set controller would recreate that pod without the operator. So I, I don't think I quite understand the question perfectly. Yeah. Um, do you by chance? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's that the replication set would know right. to bring the pod back up itself too. So yeah. um, I, I guess what I should have done is, changed the, uh, I think if I would have changed the replication set, the operator would have kicked in to snap it back to what it should have been. That probably would have been the, I believe the, the more uh, accurate demo. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so here's some good ones. Where okay. are the parameters uh, stored that you changed with the playbook, right? Like you've got your variables here, where, where do you have those var stored right now in this playbook? Um, so I think what they mean is like, in this case, I, I, I'm just feeding, I was feeding them in through the command line. I could have put them in a file that was checked into to GitHub and fed them into the playbook. 
mm-hmm. for example, or if right. you were using something like, um, you know, not to plug it, AWX or Tower, uh, mm-hmm. you could have put that, you could have built them right into the job template itself. So there are a number of different places you could have done it. In this case, I was just doing it right on the command line. And then I used uh, a lot of the default filter um, that it's built into uh, Jinja too. So uh, let me see here. I'll... Yeah, in theory, you can store these in a group VARS file like you would right. in an Ansible yeah. role. Uh, you could also potentially store them as config maps, I think. Uh, yeah, Maybe. I guess you could. I, you I could, right? I like if think you that. somehow expanded the config map a group maybe artist, maybe yeah we should probably come up with an example that. of that yeah i haven't either i'm an so. ansible guy so i think in the, you know i'm still yeah. thinking so first i'm like most in ansible terms. bridging both worlds right now so i haven't thought about that but i will definitely like go back to uh, our team and be like hey is this possible and, yeah uh, find an yeah and so that. what i have here is like I, I i i highlighted one of the areas where i had a default so if i don't set that variable it'll default to my cache service um, uh, if I would have taken a little bit more time and I probably should, I could have created this as a role and used the defaults file in there or var file in there to make this template a little less verbose itself um, mm-hmm. and also make that easier to, to edit in the future, especially if I had a lot of different defaults. This is a pretty simple definition, um, but you could see ones that could have dozens of parameters and then you know, right. be better off in a separate file. So Lucas is asking, can you give any examples for open source operators that are using Ansible right now? Um, Operator Hub that I I think it has one. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of other ones that are out in the wild that are open source. Uh, yeah, well, there there's yeah. This is something that we're working on, and yeah, I'm trying to think. Right, of like Ansible source. in the Operator SDK is fairly new, right? So just the, the 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 presence of it is within the past year i mean we just started it when i joined red hat last june so yeah, yeah. um so yeah i mean this is relatively brand new stuff so the fact that it's not in like production use cases or you know open source use cases is not surprising because we have done um like just recently started the the talking about it if that makes yeah. sense so right um uh, Lucas does point out the operator framework has an awesome operators repo. I just found that the other day. I didn't even know yeah. it existed. So that's yeah, there, also there very are, good. Right. Yeah, there um, are a number of examples. Uh, just say uh, you remind, you know, the, this question reminded me, the, the, the question from Lucas reminded me that I had a couple more slides here. Uh, yeah, definitely check out operatorhub.io. Uh, mm-hmm. This is just ready to use operators that have been uh, put out there by the community. They're not necessarily by Ansible. I think a lot of them are actually Golang, but but still, yeah. it's something you should be made aware of. And also, as you create your own, is that you could contribute them here. Um, and the other uh, couple other things to mention is for those of you looking for more information, uh, some of these links I already had in there. There's ansible.com slash operators is a good jumping off page to other um, uh, resources. And then also there's the operator framework getting started guide that's out there. Um, and um, yeah. Uh, here, here's a couple more resources for you to look at. Uh, I need to update this with the, once I publish the Mick router one that I've been using here, uh, um, to, to, to one of the, our, um, uh, you know, group repos. Uh, but there is an Etsy operator that's, uh, mm-hmm. that was done by our team when they were developing the operator SDK to validate how far can we push this thing? Is this thing as feature complete as we want it to be? Um, and then if you're looking for another simple uh, operator, very, you know, uh, related to what we were just doing, there's a, a memcache operator that you can find here under the operator uh, framework uh, organization. Uh, we hope to put more examples out there. It's something that I need to work on um, um, personally yeah. as I yeah, so all these talks. <laughs> yeah, we just uh, started the work to contribute operator framework to CNCF as an incubator project. So there's a lot of work going into this kind of all at once. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's, there's, there's much, much, much more to be done. Um, so uh, some questions going back to your demo. Can you yeah. delete the deployment instead of the pod so that the actual uh, operator gets recreated or recreates the pods and everything okay, else? Let me, uh, let me yeah, switch your that. terminals back. Uh, 
let's see. In Ansible, can you filter for specific events in the watches file? Yes. Yes. Uh, I can. I did that one live. That was easy. Um, so yeah, you can filter for any of those things uh, with Ansible. Uh, you're gonna. Do yeah, there's a, there's a number of features in watches in the watches file. You can do like finalizers too that I didn't go over. Uh, but if you go and look at the documentation under um, the operator SDK. Uh, in the Ansible section, you'll see more options there. Um, all right, sorry. So we were looking to- So someone's asking for examples of upgrading memcache versions. I would say like there's tons of examples uh, of upgrading memcache on Ansible Galaxy, galaxy.ansible.com. Uh, that is the place for people to share roles and you can take those roles and then reuse them in your Ansible operator. Uh, and that would be, the, uh, I just closed the Q&A window. That would be the best way to like figure out how to do that with an Ansible operator because I don't have an example to do that right now. Uh, why? Yes. And that's done. Um, uh, how do Kate secrets and Ansible vault secrets play along together? They really don't. They're kind of two different things. Um, uh, you can use them both in this use case, but I would recommend... Uh, sticking with the Kate's secrets for now uh, and using those inside your cluster as opposed to trying to expand uh, Ansible Vault things on the fly. Yeah. All right. Let me, I'm going to give this a whirl here and try to delete the CNCF cache deployment. Um, and the operator should bring that back. Let me see here. I've never tried this before, so this should be really interesting. There you go. Yep, Container there it is. Done. Came back. <clears throat> so, all right. Can you? Uh, so, I really like. We need multi-threaded Q and A in Zoom, but we are at the top of the hour. Yeah. Uh, everybody, I'm very sorry if I didn't get to your questions. Um, please feel free to reach out to Tim or myself uh, via Tim Twitter, GitHub, uh, email, and um, we will be sharing this webinar. Uh, at cncf.io slash webinars. Yep. And uh, come see us you. at KubeCon. Yeah, come see we'll, us at we'll KubeCon. Be in, I'll be in the Red Hat booth uh, presenting. I'll also be presenting at the, uh, uh, was it the Cloud Native Rejects conference mm -hmm. the weekend before KubeCon. Yes, I will also be at KubeCon as well. Um, uh, we look forward to seeing all of you at the next CNCF webinar. Thanks for joining us today. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone.